for helping me uh, write this paper. Well, we all wrote this paper together, of course. Um, but anyway, on to the talk itself. What we're going to be talking about is characterizing um, certain security properties for a class of algorithms. So up on the screen, you see two different LinyCrypt programs. Uh, it turns out that one of these two programs um, is collision resistant, whereas the other program fails to even be second to pre-image resistant. And how do we tell the difference between these two? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So what are LinyCrypt programs? So up on the screen, we can see an example of a LinyCrypt program. Well, LinyCrypt programs are a um, class of algorithms or a model of computation introduced by Karmer and Roselec in 2016. They lend themselves to powerful analysis through um, algebra, algebraic terms such as span and linear independence. But what are we actually able to do in a LinyCrypt program? Well, we can actually take inputs to our functions. These are inputs from a field. Um, traditionally speaking, we can also sample randomly from the field, but in those cases, we're considering those random uh, samples to actually be included in the inputs to the function. We can take field elements and send them through a random oracle to get new field elements outward, uh, often to make the association between the program and the uh, random oracle explicit, we write ph. We can take our uh, field elements that we get either from inputs or from queries to the random oracle, and we can use some sort of fixed linear combination, and by fixed I mean fixed from the beginning of the uh, program, to combine these uh, field elements into new field elements. And finally, we can return any of these intermediate, uh, intermediate values that we get throughout the execution of the program um, out of the program. These include not only inputs or outputs from inputs to the program or outputs from the random oracle, but also linear combinations uh, therein. So LinyCrypt lends itself to multiple models of how to uh, actually reason about these programs. We have the more natural algorithmic view, which is just a sequence of operations that one would take to uh, run a program. This may be the more natural way of thinking about it. We also have a graphical view um, in a DAG form. Uh, the, the reason that we don't have cycles are because of the calls to random oracles. And finally, we have the algebraic view, which is the more, uh, the more important view for our paper and for reasoning about some of these algebraic properties. Uh, of course, it being an algebraic view. So previously, in Roselec and Karmer's work in 2016, they looked at when two random LinyCrypt programs are indistinguishable from each other in terms of their output. But what about collision resistance or second pre-image resistance for these type of algorithms? Well, as it turns out, all of both of these properties, not only collision resistance but also second pre-image res resistance, can be characterized in terms of linear, algebra prop linear algebraic properties, as I said earlier, such as span and linear independence. And although our paper produces um, concrete bounds that are different between um, second preimages and collisions as we'd expect, asymptotically speaking, the two are equivalent for these um, programs. So before we get into the nitty gritty, uh, what do we mean by second preimages or collisions in LinyCrypt? Well, as it turns out, it's exactly as we'd expect from the natural constructions. Basically, given some output from a LinyCrypt program and the pre-image or the set of inputs that generate it. An adversary, or maybe not, gives us some different set of inputs or a different pre-image such that when we run it through the program, we get the same output as the original run. So let's see what it looks like finding a collision or a second pre-image inside a LinyCrypt program. So before we, we uh, run through this, I'm just going to say we have a special recipe for cooking up um, collisions and second preimages that we're actually going to follow in this example. So first thing we're going to do, of course, is show the two sets of execution. On one side, we have the, algorith the algorithmic run, and on the second side, we have, with a new set of internal variables, the graphical run. So since this is a collision or second preimage, our outputs need to be the same between both of the runs. 
Because of this, v5, one of our outputs, needs to be the same in both runs. And due to the oracle constraints uh, imposed by the uh, query on um, v3, which gives us v5, since v5 is now fixed, v3 is now fixed. And because of that, v3, one of our input vectors, would be the same between both of the runs. Now, following our special recipe, we're going to choose v6 to be chosen arbitrarily, but different between the two runs. Then, because of our oracle constraints, v7 needs to be different uh, between the two runs, since uh, the uh, oracle constraint imposed by taking or uh, the oracle query of v6, giving us v7, means that the outputs need to be different between the two. Then, since we now know that v8, one of our output vectors, is the same between both runs, and we know what v7 is, v1 is now uniquely determined by the system, and we can solve backwards uh, using linear algebra to determine v1 on both systems. And as it turns out, the uh, v1 will be actually different between both of the executions because of how we chose v6 arbitrarily. Now, we've actually found one of our input vectors that is different between both runs. Finally, we can use the information that we have on v1 and v3 and v6 to, and some linear algebra to intelligently solve backwards for v2 in both of the runs. Now, what we have at this point is we have, by construction, different inputs to our uh, Linicrypt program that produce the same outputs, or a collision. Now, the way that we've done this following our special recipe actually allows us to find second preimages the exact same way. So this is the general idea of what we did, and a kind of outline for the recipe that we followed. We identified some set of oracle queries that were the same between both of the runs. We identified some oracle query that was different between the runs. It's special, it's, a, it's what we call our special oracle query. Then, using the information that we had, we solved backwards for all of the internal queries. And incidentally, turns out that we also solved backwards for all of our input vectors, which, like our oracle queries, can determine the entire system. Now, the algorithmic view, or the graphical view, may be more natural to look through However, it's not as powerful, and it doesn't lend itself to algebraic analysis. So we need to start easing ourselves into the algebraic representation of these Linicrypt programs. So, oh, it looks like that fell off. OK. Um, as we can see, we have the base variables highlighted. Now, what do I mean by base variables? Base variables are any variables in the uh, run of the Linicrypt program that either come in as input or come out of some oracle query. All the other values inside of a Linicrypt program are actually just linear combinations of these variables. So they're the ones that we actually want to keep track of. And to uh, separate the outputs of the Linicrypt program from the rest of the system, we keep all of the outputs of the program inside of a new matrix called M. But there's something missing in this representation there's some sort of internal structure that we don't end up capturing through this simple algebraic representation. And that is the relationship imposed by these oracle queries. That's why we have the full algebraic representation, which you can see uh, on the right side of the screen with C and M. Now, M is just the same in both of, our, in both of the examples. It just holds the outputs of our program. However, C is now a new matrix which represents the, not only the base vectors of our system that are important to us, but also represents the uh, relationships imposed by oracle queries in our program. Turns out that this actually allows us to uniquely construct a Linicrypt program. So as I was saying, it, kind of, it, rep it helps represent the relationship between oracle queries. As we can see here, the first line of C shows us the um, relationship between v1 and v4. Now, what if we were given a uh, what if we were given a collision? We were given two inputs that generated the same output. Well, we can run these two in parallel, side by side, and see what kind of happens during the run. So, first thing we can do is identify base variables shared between both of the programs. Uh, this can be done just by running through the programs themselves. Now. 
This isn't necessarily going to happen. There may not be base variables shared, but if there are, we can identify them now. Finally, we can identify a base variable that is different. We're guaranteed to have a base variable inside the system that's different because the inputs of the, uh, the inputs of the system are different, but the outputs are the same. Turns out that this, um, this base variable right here, the corresponding query, uh, the inputs of that query must be linearly independent of the uh, queries that we said were the same between both runs. Otherwise, the output would have been uniquely determined to be the same in both runs. Finally, we can solve backwards using linear algebra until all of our queries are defined. But what might go wrong here? Now, what happens if we have this type of constraint where we expect v7 to not be fixed or we expect v6 to not be fixed, but it is? What if we, how do, how do we get around this? Maybe if we had an order in which the Oracle queries were set up, we might be able to forego this problem. So this is where we get that special recipe coming in. So a collision structure is a, is one, a ordering of C, or the ordering of the queries of the um, program, and some sort of special query I, the uh, this, this special query that we start the chain reaction off of. As we said earlier, the inputs to I cannot be in the span of the queries before, before it or inside the total output. Otherwise, it would have been marked as green or marked as the same in both runs, and we'd have to choose a different special query. Finally, to make sure that we don't get stuck at any point of the run, we uh, impose this constraint on the collision structure. Now, this is the uh, general form of the recipe that we saw at the beginning of the talk. But what if we made a small change? Well, it turns out that our collision structures are actually the special sauce that we were using to cook up these collisions or second pre-images. So really fast, here's a, here's a run. Um, without loss of generality, we can say that the attacker will make all queries inside both the original run and the second pre-image run, so we can have those set up in parallel. Which queries are the same between both runs? Well, all of our outputs are going to be the same between both runs, so we can immediately mark those as green. And everything that uh, leads to those outputs directly, we can then work backwards to mark as green. So what is our special query here, just following the run of uh, the adversary? Well, it turns out that the first non-green query, or the non-same non query that the adversary makes in both the runs, is our special query. Finally, we can use all this information we have to work backwards to determine all of our inputs and find our collision structure. So, uh, here's, the, here's the conclusion. Um, as it turns out, collision structures in a program, the lack of collision resistance, a lack of pre resistance are equivalent, uh, modular degeneracy, of course, degenerate programs. So, turns out that collisions, second pre-images, and linear crit programs can be boiled down to algebraic terms such as span and linear independence. Um, these properties of span and linear independence lend themselves to polynomial time algorithms. Actually, in our paper, we present a polynomial time algorithm for finding collision structures in arbitrary um, linear crit programs. And now that we've shown that collision resistance and second preimage resistance are equivalent, we can actually simplify our security parameters for these type of functions. So one thing I kind of skipped over a little bit is that all of our functions, uh, all of our, uh, sorry, the linear crit program class we're looking at are ones with distinct nonces basically uh, given to each of the Oracle queries. Uh, this is actually really important. On the top, we have a collision-resistant run, and on the bottom, we have a run that fails to be collision-resistant. The only difference is that one has nonces and one doesn't. The reason being is that the attacker can intelligently choose inputs to the function, y equals uh, a call of the Oracle on x, which effectively expands the program's uh, scope. And it turns out that, these, that determining these properties for these type of functions is actually NP-complete. Finally, uh, this was in the random oracle model. However, uh, it should be easy to expand it into the ideal cipher model. And thank you. We have time for questions. So can you say how you deal with degenerate programs? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> so, degenerate programs are a special class of programs <laughs> where uh, one of the things I said earlier in the talk was that since we had different inputs, 
and the same output, there must be some internal state that differs. Well, degenerate programs are the one thing that breaks that rule. Basically, um, these programs are so simply terrible that they fall out of the scope of the, um, the uh, collision structure result. Basically, here's a, here's a good example. The, we have an Oracle query on X uh, with a linear comboed with Y. But as it turns out, this actually gives us an entire space of collision inputs Basically, anything that I'm going to put heavy quotation around this sums to the same input to this um, Oracle query. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? Okay, if not, then um, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>